Hello, my name is Beverly Greenwood van Meerveld, and in my capacity as the current ANMS president, I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of planned virtual clinical and scientific symposia sponsored by the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Society. The goal of these virtual symposia is to not only provide you with the latest information on a topic of particular interest in the field of neurogastroenterology and motility, but also to provide you with a positive distraction from the pandemic and allow us to connect with our colleagues. The topic of today's ANMS symposia is entitled Diagnostic and Therapeutic Approach to EGJ Outlet Obstruction. And we'll, we will have three presentations from leaders in the field. Before I start, I'd like to thank each of our three speakers today. I would also like to thank the members of the ANMS Meetings Task Force for developing the program. Finally, I'd like to thank Stanford University for hosting this virtual event today and to thank Dr. Linda Wynn in her capacity as an ANMS counselor and Laurie Ennis, the executive director of the ANMS for making this all happen. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you today our moderator, Dr. Linda Wynn. Dr. Wynn is a clinical associate professor at Stanford University. She also serves as clinical director of the Digestive Health Center and director of neurogastroenterology and motility at Stanford. Thank you, Linda, and welcome. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, I'm excited to uh, launch our and moderate our first uh, virtual symposia. Uh, and uh, stay tuned at the end for a list of our new programs uh, that we have planned for the rest of 2020. It is with great honor that I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Christy Lynch uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. And she will be talking to us about what is EGJ outflow uh, obstruction. Dr. Lynch, please share your slide. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Just give me one second, I'm trying to get my slides going. All right, there we go. Good afternoon and evening, everyone. It's great to see everyone here. I'm Crystal Lynch from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much to Beverly and John and ANMS for having me today. I will be doing the first of three talks today on EGJ outflow obstruction. And the title of my talk is EGJ outflow obstruction, current definition and evaluation. Um, I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. So we often think of the EGJ just as this squamoclumnar junction that we see every day on endoscopy, but it's important to keep in mind sort of the whole anatomy um, when you think about EGJ outflow obstruction. So the lower esophageal sphincter we know is anchored by the frenoesophageal ligament to the curl part of the diaphragm. And we'll sort of keep that in mind as we go throughout this lecture. And so what is EGJ outflow obstruction? We know that it's an abnormal topographic pattern defined on high resolution esophageal manometry. So it's not a disease, this is a diagnosis that we see on manometry. So for many of the people uh, on in training, fellows and former fellows, we have a normal high resolution manometry here. Um, the critical landmarks you can see I've labeled here for you. Um, but the most important part that's critical to the Chicago classification is the IRP, the integrated relaxation pressure. So the, the most that the uh, GE junction relaxes, so the lowest value over four contiguous or non-contiguous seconds during each swallow. And so when we think about the Chicago classification, we sort of divide it in our heads into a normal IRP or an elevated IRP. So when the median IRP is less than 15, we know that we have some major disorders of peristalsis, including dysesophageal spasm, where there is at least two swallows with a short dyslatency, jackhammer esophagus, so at least two swallows with greater than 8,000 for the DCI, and absent contractility, where there's 100% field swallows. The minor disorders of peristalsis, including ineffective motility and fragmented peristalsis, 
have at least 50% infected or fragmented swallows. And then we know the definition of a normal manometry on um, Chicago classification should have a normal median IRP and a, an over 50% effective swallows. So when we sort of go to the other side, we remember that when the median IRP is actually elevated 15 or greater, when there's no intact peristalsis, that's considered achalasia. And then when there's some intact peristalsis, that what, that's what brings us to the diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction. So what does this look like on manometry? So here on the swallow, we can see that there's some intact peristalsis. The distal latency is normal, greater than 4.5. And we can see sort of this band of pressurization um, across the LES. So indeed, there's impaired EGJ relaxation um, with an IRP of 20. This manometry also shows EGJ alpha obstruction, but it definitely looks distinct from the prior. You can see that the distal latency is normal, but there's sort of distal pressurization in the esophagus uh, with an impaired EGJ relaxation. So already we can see that um, EGJ outflow obstruction on manometry uh, is heterogeneous. So when you think about the anatomy of the esophagogastric junction, it's not surprising that secondary causes are often reported um, in up to 66% of cases. So there'll be a Zoom poll sort of popping up for you, um, looking at what your workup is for secondary causes, and we'll review that in a little bit. So we're gonna go through some of the secondary causes of EGG outflow obstruction now. So this is a static image um, from a barium swallow, and you can see that there's a piece of the stomach above the diaphragm. So this is one of the most common secondary causes of EGG outflow obstruction, and that would be a hiatal hernia. Yep. All right, the poll is coming up now. All right. So here on this picture, this is an endoscopic view and retroflexion. And you can see that the mucosa at the GE junction is not your sort of native anatomic mucosa. And so this patient had a Nissen fundoplication. This is just a pearl for all those in training who are on this call. Remember that normal manometry values are based on patients without prior surgery. So something to keep in mind when you're reading manometry. Continuing um, looking at secondary causes, this is another static barium swallow image. <clears throat> and you can see a ring here in the distal esophagus. This is a Schatzky ring. This is an endoscopic view looking towards the distal esophagus. So there's a couple abnormalities you can see here. There's definitely loss of vascular pattern, um, pallor or edema, and you can see the ringed appearance. Additionally, you can see that some of the rings appear to be obstructing. So here we have EOE as well as strictures. This is another endoscopic view of the distal esophagus. And here you can see these engorged vessels sort of running linearly. And this is a patient I have with esophageal varices, um, which is a rare cause, but definitely can be a secondary cause of EGG outflow obstruction. And the varices were banded. So this is an endoscopic image that we all you know, prefer not to see. You see this heterogeneous sort of friable mucosa. Um, and indeed this patient had malignancy there. So definitely something to keep in the back of your mind as well. And then lastly, medications. It is really important to make sure that you review medications for your patients with this diagnosis. Opiates have been shown to cause this as well as antipsychotics. So numerous studies have reported the association between opioid use and elevated LES relaxation pressures. This is a study done on chronic opioid users. And you can see that um, in the left blue bar, 27% of patients had EGG outflow obstruction. Those were the patients who were studied on opiates. The red bar with only 7% of patients with a diagnosis of EGG outflow obstruction were studied off of opiates. Additionally, they looked at achalasia and they noticed that type 3 achalasia was found in 11% of patients on opiates and 0% off. Smaller studies have reported antipsychotics to have the same association. So here's a manometry of a patient who is actively on opioid treatment. And the diagnosis here is EGG outflow obstruction. 
you can see sort of that the LES is not relaxing. So this is the same patient off of opioid therapy. And you can see when they swallow, there's that nice relaxation of a lower esophageal sphincter. And indeed, when they analyzed the study, the IRP was normal here. So when you think about secondary causes, there's many categories that we consider. Structural, um, post-surgical, I mean, sort of any bariatric uh, surgery or foregut surgery, um, infiltrative or inflammatory causes, systemic sclerosis, amyloidosis, malignancy, as well as medications. So here's my pearl for the fellows. My mnemonic is don't miss any secondary causes. So M-M-I-I-S-S, -S, medications, malignancy, infiltrative, inflammatory, surgical, and structural. And so this is sort of where our poll comes in here. Our workup for secondary causes, it's definitely important to include an upper endoscopy, a barium swallow, and a good med rack. It's also been recommended in the Chicago classification to consider cross-sectional imaging, uh, whether that's by EUS or CT scan. Um, however, there have been some small studies, there's no you know, extremely large studies on EGGL flow obstruction showing us, but there is sort of a low yield of these cross-sectional imaging um, studies. So they definitely should be considered um, in specific cases. And so we can see here on the poll that it's sort of across the board. And I think it does depend on the patient um, on what you do, but it's nice to know that, you know, mostly everyone is including the upper endoscopy uh, and barium swallow. So let's say we do all these studies. We find no hiatal hernia, no stricture, nothing infiltrative. So now we're sort of stuck with primary or idiopathic EGJ outflow obstruction. So this has been reported in up to 14% of manometries and appears to be increasing in incidence. This diagnosis has been seen more commonly in females than males. And the average age range is between 51 and 69 years old. Presenting symptoms are variable. So the most common presenting symptom is dysphagia, but the, the ranges in studies of this are wide. Um, also, you'll note chest pain, regurgitation, and GERD symptoms. However, I mean, regurgitation, for example, four to 73%, that frequency range is extremely variable and many patients have multiple symptoms. On the other category, we have sort of everything from belching to nausea to cough. Um, so there's basically a, a lot of things, a lot of symptoms that patients present with and the presentation itself appears heterogeneous. So how do we target therapy? It makes sense to target the lower esophageal sphincter. After all, that is what's abnormal on the manometry to define this. Additionally, we know that EGJ outflow obstruction can evolve to achalasia. It's in a minority of patients, but clearly it's consequential um, because you would obviously want to treat patients differently if they had achalasia. So here I've put together a sort of treatment response graph. And so looking at things that have been trialed for patients. Again, many of these studies are small. There's a wide range of response. So for medications, anywhere between zero and 75% of patients have been shown to respond. Additionally, the data is tough because the medications are variable. PPIs, calcium channel blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, it, it, it's, it's pretty variable. Botox injection uh, has been shown to uh, be pretty fare pretty well with 40 to 100% of patients responding, uh, depending on the study. TTS balloons with a little bit less response. Pneumatic dilation, again, with a wide range. And myotomy, um, both POEM and laparoscopic helomyotomy have been pretty successful, and this will be discussed a little bit further in the other lectures. However, it's important to note that spontaneous symptom resolution has been reported in one study in up to 74% of patients with EGG outflow obstruction. And so that's definitely something to keep in mind when we come across this diagnosis. So at this point, we're saying EGG alpha obstruction can be incidental. It may have, you know, sort of nebulous symptoms and uh, the symptoms may improve spontaneously. But we've also said that it can be early achalasia. It could be achalasia and evolution, and these patients will definitely need some sort of therapy. And so how I think about it is EGG outflow obstruction is the spectrum of disease. And we definitely need 
to sort of talk about what other workup we do to help identify which patients warrant therapy and which patients may respond to therapy. And that'll be discussed in the following two lectures. So my take home points today, primary EGGL obstruction is a manometric pattern with a heterogeneous presentation. Secondary causes should be evaluated via MedRAC, upper endoscopy, and barium swallow. Cross-sectional imaging should also be considered and further discussion on disease characterization and therapeutic guidance is to follow. So the question and answer will be at the very end of the third lecture, but please feel free to add any questions to the Zoom chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Thank you, and I guess it's on to you, Prakash. Great, Th thank you, Dr. Lynch. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Prakash Gawali, who does not require any introductions. He's a professor of medicine at the Washington University in St. Louis. He will be talking to us about EGJ outflow obstruction, complementary and diagnostic tools. Uh, as Dr. Lynch mentioned, there is a Q&A uh, box. Feel free to type questions in there. Our panelists will answer towards the end. Uh, if you like, you can also try to answer each other um, as well as vote up questions uh, that we can pose to our panelists later on. So Dr. Nawali. Thank you, Linda, and thank you to the ANMS, to Beverly, to John, and uh, uh, the, the uh, conference committee for organizing this to replace some of our live conferences. Uh, it's a great honor to present at this, and uh, I have to try and uh, follow such an excellent initiation or start of this conference. I'd like to start by saying that uh, EGJ outflow obstruction is a pattern that you see on high resolution manometry. And it is up to the operator, up to the physician, up to the gastroenterologist to decide if this is real. In other words, is this a true obstructive phenomenon at the esophageal gastric junction, or is this an artifact? There can also be instances where true obstruction is underdiagnosed. And so I will try to address both underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis of esophageal gastric junction. So in order to get to this point, you have to really know why you are ordering the manometry study or why was the manometry done. If the manometry was done for a transit symptom and you find an obstructive feature, that is relevant or can be relevant. On the other hand, if the manometry was done for reflux and you find an obstructive feature, that is a discrepant finding and you'll have to decide how to solve that issue. That is where some of these complementary diagnostic tools come into play. You have to start out with manometry. And since uh, the uh, issue at hand is at the esophageal gastric junction, you have to initially make sure that the catheter is properly positioned. In other words, it's through, it's passed through the esophageal gastric junction. It's two components of the esophageal gastric junction, the lower esophageal sphincter and the crawl diaphragm. And asking a person to breathe deeply can identify uh, the uh, diaphragmatic cruel contraction uh, by the changes in, uh, in pressure in the thoracic and the abdominal cavity. Sometimes you see a pattern like this. This is a curled catheter where the catheter has turned up uh, after hitting something or not going through the esophageal gastric junction. I would, I would propose that this suggests maybe that there is an obstructive phenomenon. So if you see a cold catheter, that might be a surrogate that the person might have some form of esophageal outflow obstruction. There are also other elements in the manometry study that suggest a, a true obstruction. And one of those features is when you see um, a pattern that looks like this. This is compartmentalization of pressure. You are seeing pressure between the lower esophageal sphincter and the crural diaphragm. This is compartmentalized pressure. This is an obstructing type three hernia. In contrast to this one, where there is no obstruction, there is no compartmentalization of pressure. Here's another situation where you have the lower esophageal sphincter and the crawl diaphragm and pressure compartmentalizing that you can also measure in, ter in terms of an elevated IRP. This is a paraesophageal and axial hernia. Here's another one. And here's yet another one where the diaphragm is not traversed. 
And this is a paraesophageal and axial hernia. You only see the LES, but you see that compartmentalization of pressure. The pressure that you see over here, the pressurization that we see, is a manifestation that the intrabolus pressure has nowhere to go. In other words, there is an obstruction distally. So in a normal Klaus plot, as Chrissy showed, you do not see intrabolus pressure during the period of uh, a lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. And that's because that intrabolus pressure transmits to the stomach. So you don't see it, you can't measure it. On the other hand, in a situation like this, this is type two achalasia, you see compartmentalization of pressure from the upper sphincter to the lower sphincter. Because the lower sphincter doesn't relax, it's obstructed. And what you're seeing is intrabolus pressure or pressurization. In other words, pressurization is surrogate for obstruction. You don't see it in type one achalasia because the esophagus is so flabby that it can't build this intrabolus pressure. You see it in type two achalasia. You may see it at the front of the, uh, of the uh, premature sequence in type three achalasia. And obviously EGJ outflow obstruction is defined by an obstructive feature where uh, the EGJ uh, uh, post-residual pressure is high, but that diagnosis is supported by seeing the compartmentalization of pressure between the contraction front and the esophageal gastric junction. But there are problems with just using IRP for diagnosis of esophageal gastric junction. You can have both over and under diagnosis. Here is an example of under diagnosis. Nobody would argue that this person probably has esophageal gastric junction outflow obstruction in a, in a setting of a jackhammer type batter. What has happened is the uh, LES has been pulled up into the chest. So if you were to measure the IRP at the normal position, it would look normal. But if you were to follow the LES into the chest, the IRP is clearly abnormal. We already talked about the effect of opioids. I'm not going to go back to that. But effect of structural lesions, this is a gastric lap band. And you can, you can imagine a similar situation if you had a tight um, uh, cancer or a tight stricture that will cause um, a, a pattern that, to look like this. Again, look for the compartmentalization of pressure. There's pressure compartmentalizing between the contraction front and the esophageal gastric junction. Now, on the other direction, again, you can have a pattern that looks like absent contractility, um, but uh, you could be missing true achalasia in that setting. And uh, one of the complementary tools that I'll talk about in a minute where uh, you, can, you can get further clarity in some of these situations is FLIP. Why is it important? We don't have good management for absent contractility. We have management available for achalasia. So it's important not to miss achalasia in this situation. And like I mentioned, some of these major motor disorders like hypercontractile disorders can have an obstructive element to them, especially if the presentation includes uh, this phase. In fact, any of these major motor disorders can have an obstructive element. And uh, it may not be evident just by looking at the IRP. So what can you do in this setting? One of the things that you can do to prevent overdiagnosis is to use upright swallows. So an upright IRP more than 12 is an indication that you're likely going to see uh, a radiographic EGJ outflow obstruction, uh, you might uh, have correlation with symptoms. So this is another piece that can help uh, consolidate the conclusion of outflow obstruction. So if the IRP is high in the supine position and in the upright position, you have additional evidence for outflow obstruction. One other metric from your standard study is the nadir UES residual pressure. When the esophagus pressurizes, the UES contracts, so it increases its tone. And, and when that happens, the nadir pressure during UES relaxation uh, can be compromised. So in, in a normal person, that uh, nadir pressure can be negative. But as you can see in these achalasia syndromes, the pressure is on the positive side. And so if you take patients with EGJ outflow obstruction, Achalasia variants and spastic disorders tend to have um, an elevated UES residual pressure, nadir UES, UES pressure, which can be another piece that can consolidate or add support to your conclusion of true EGJ outflow obstruction. Now, looking at the impedance pattern, especially in a setting where a, a volume of fluid is given to the patient 
and you can see the fluid uh, remaining in the esophagus in the upright position can help uh, define that there is obstruction. Now, this is an image that uh, John Pandolfino gave me several years ago, but uh, this was uh, a situation where 200 ml of uh, uh, saline was given to the patient at the end of the menagerie, and the patient was asked to stand up for five minutes, and you can see the impedance bolus height on manometry corresponds to the barium height on a timed upright barium. But some of the true uh, adjunctive measures that can be performed during manometry are the provocative maneuvers. So one of these is the rapid drink challenge, similar to what I just mentioned with the impedance bolus height, 100 to 200 ml of water in the upright position, the patient's asked to uh, drink this through a straw as fast as they can. The normal response is no contraction, no contractility during the swallowing, but complete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And at the end of the last swallow, um, a, a, an augmented contraction, although it, it would be a rapid drink challenge, sometimes you may not see a contraction at all. So in other words, the, the fluid bolus should flow through an open esophageal gastric junction into the stomach. Here's what you could see with obstructive patterns. So here you see contraction and compartmentalization. Again, intrabolus pressure visible because there is a problem with, with emptying. And here is a floridly achalasia-like pattern in somebody who had a normal manometry. You can also see esophageal shortening. And uh, here a 7.5 centimeter shortening with compartmentalization upstream. And another example of panesophageal pressurization. If you were look, to look at the IRP during the rapid drink challenge, that correlates with the Eckerd score, which is usually used to evaluate the symptomatic state in achalasia. But you have to plan for the rapid drink challenge. In other words, a patient with dysphagia starts with the symptom. Patient with dysphagia, if you do a rapid drink challenge and it's abnormal, uh, the, norm, the regular motility is normal, it helps decide or helps your, your, your uh, further evaluation uh, of the EGJ towards uh, uh, um, diagnosing an obstructive phenomenon. Now, um, when are RDC findings positive? This, this is a study that was done by Sabine Roman in, in Lyon, and you can see the, the different causes of EGJ outflow obstruction in her series, which accounted for 2% of all their HRM studies over five years. And this is the breakdown of the abnormal or normal rapid drink challenge. So patients with previous surgery, you can see about half of them had a positive study. Achalasia, most of them had a, a positive rapid drink challenge. Neoplasia, about half and half. Other causes, again, here now you start having lesser numbers of, of uh, positive RDC. In other words, a positive rapid drink challenge is probably going to identify true abnormal obstructive features in these patients. You can also do a provocative meal, a standardized test meal. And uh, during the meal, uh, the obstructive feature may be more evident during the solid phase of the meal. You can also ask the patient to bring whatever food item they have dysphagia with and have them eat that with the catheter in place. And the solid taste test meal typically increases the yield for major motor disorders while reducing the yield for minor motor disorders. Now, going beyond manometry, we have barium studies. Chrissy already talked about the value of barium in identifying hernias and, uh, and rings, but a timed upright barium swallow can help evaluate for uh, achalasia variants, achalasia, and other forms of obstruction, as, as can be seen here. This is the barium study from the patient I saw, showed in my earlier slide that looked like absent contractility, and nobody would mistake this uh, for anything other than achalasia. You can also do a barium pill swallow, and the pill impacts, the 13 millimeter barium pill impacts in the distal esophagus. In the setting of dysphagia in a, in a manometry that suggests outflow obstruction, then the obstruction that you're seeing is probably real. Now, the next tool. That, that can be used is FLIP, functional lumen imaging probe. This consists of uh, a bag with, uh, with, uh, with impedance sensors within, and um, uh, the measure that is most useful is what's called the distensibility index. It's the relationship between cross-sectional area and intrabag pressure at the esophageal gastric junction. You can see the FLIP 1.0 image uh, this is actually a normal patient. You see the contraction going down the esophagus and the EGJ opening up at the end with the distensibility index near four. 
Uh, this is data from Chicago that showed that most achalasia subtypes will have a low EGJ distensibility index. Indeed, some of the major motor disorders also will. There is some overlap in the IEM and normal manometry groups. Now, um, FLIP is advanced in that you can look at esophageal body contractility. You can, you can plot this as a change in lumen diameter going from uh, proximal to distal esophagus and a, a predominantly antegrade contraction pattern with uh, an open esophagogastric junction or the repetitive antegrade contractions is thought to be a normal pattern, whereas a, a, a retrograde contraction pattern with non-opening of the esophagogastric junction, it can be an abnormal pattern. So flip topography, here are examples. This is a normal pattern with antegrade contractions and good opening of the esophagogastric junction. Um, here is an example of achalasia. There is no contractility in the esoph esophageal body and no opening of the esophagogastric junction. And here is a pattern in somebody who was on opioids uh, with an obstructive pattern, a type three achalasia pattern on manometry. You can see predominantly retrograde pattern, retrograde contractions with non-opening of the esophagogastric junction. So uh, this is a figure from a paper that's gonna come out in the American Journal of Gastro that defines which flip findings are definitively abnormal and which findings could be uh, definitively normal. Uh, uh, the findings in between the likely abnormal and, and indeterminate may require support from other modes of uh, testing uh, uh, before a final conclusion of obstruction can be made. So how do you refine the diagnosis of obstruction? High resolution manometry, high resolution impedance manometry. From standard uh, manometry, you can get some of these uh, elements that are listed here. Intrabolus pressure, compartmentalization of pressure, impedance height, and UES nadir pressure. Provocative measures, upright swallows, rapid drink challenge, standardized test meal can be of value. Consider opioid-induced EGJ outflow obstruction. Investigate further if provocative testing is abnormal. And you can do barium. Um, this can uh, be a barium pill swallow or a uh, timed upright barium. Uh, a second opinion endoscopy is useful, and at that time, uh, you could use a therapeutic approach if there was enough evidence on some of the other tests. And, um, and the therapeutic approaches that could be tried include dilation and botulinum toxin injection, although observation and behavioral ther therapy are viable approaches if there isn't solid evidence for outflow obstruction. Now, uh, the flip can be done during the second opinion of endoscopy, and that could direct uh, what kind of therapy was provided between dilation and Botox or observation and behavioral therapy. It's important to remember achalasia and pseudoachalasia. There is usually weight loss and other features, other symptoms and findings associated with these. Routine imaging or ultrasound uh, do not have a very high yield, and observe and follow is a viable option an EGJ outflow obstruction. With that, I'm gonna end and hand over to uh, uh, Benson for the next part. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash, for that great talk. Up next is Dr. Benson Massey, the director of the GM Motility Lab at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Massey will be discussing management approach to esophagogastric outflow uh, obstruction. Benson, please take it away, and everybody, please continue to send us your questions. Well, Linda, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk at this uh, innovative seminar. I'm impressed by the number of people who uh, signed on to watch this. And it also tells us, really, in the community, how much concern there is and confusion over this uh, entity. Uh, We've heard uh, two excellent presentations so far. My charge was to talk about management approach uh, to this. And uh, I will say, when I think about the general principles for management of EGGU, the first is to ensure that the condition is truly present. I'm not talking about just the metametric features but uh, of a high IRP, but other evidence that you really do have an instructive process going on. I then think you have to think about whether the patient, again, as emphasized earlier, what's the situation? Is this found in someone being worked up for something else, or are they actually having problems that are really important, such as uh, obstructive dysphagic symptoms? And then finally, I think you have to tailor the treatment to the etiology, whether this be structural, uh, impaired 
true smooth muscle LES relaxation abnormalities in which you have to really consider the opioid induced uh, entities. And finally, a mixed situation where you could have more than one of these uh, together. Well, this is the point I would like to, to for people to, to take home from the audience is that a high IRP does not equal egg ju, all right? Yes, with egg ju, you have a high IRP, but not every high IRP you see is really representing egg ju because the issue is, is you can have some artifactual problems giving you a high IRP. Even when you have, and I might even say, especially when you have a potential structural cause present, perhaps such as a hiatal hernia or uh, a lower esophageal ring, a high RP can represent an artifact from catheter angulation and impingement in addition to other issues such as pressure drift uh, during the study. So I think at a minimum, when you're trying to evaluate a high IRP and why this represents egg ju, you want to see this abnormal IRP present in both in the upright and supine swallows as uh, uh, Prakash had mentioned earlier. And you also want to see evidence of an elevated intrabolus pressure because if there's truly obstruction present, the intrabolus pressure to liquid should be high. And indeed at the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, in the past year or so, Arash Bhavaya looked at this, and if you look at people who might be candidates to have egg ju based on a supine high IRP, once you looked at upright IRP and whether they actually had intrabolus pressure, we were able to essentially to just count most of these potential egg ju cases as actually being artifactual. Well, how can you get this sort of artifactual sort of high IRP? Well, I'm just going to show you a uh, a sort of benchtop way to do this here. This is something I, I did some years ago by just taking a graduated uh, syringe, stick it with a narrowing here, put this in an Erlenmeyer flask to sort of give you a sort of a, if you will, a stricture and a sort of hiatal hernia and put the catheter in here in such a way where you might have the tip impinged down here in the hernia sac. And one can see here, if you look on the screen, we have a high pressure zone here and no muscle is contracting here nothing is moving, okay? But if you move the cylinder up and down, such as might be happening if you move the LES up and down with respiration or slightly with deglutition, we're gonna have some slight falls in this high pressure zone here. And indeed, if you look at this on the e-sleeve capability here, this might look like some sort of LES relaxation, but with a high residual pressure, this might be, if you will, a high IRP. Uh, does, this, does this system have egg juice? Well, if you simply pull the catheter back and straighten out that impingement, you can see your high pressure zone goes away completely. Now you might say, well, Benson, sure you can do this with an Erlenmeyer flask, but this has ever happened you know, in real life manometry. And, and certainly it can, and here's sort of an example of it in someone with a hiatal hernia. One can see the region of the LES here, one can see region of the crura here, and one sees fairly high pressures here at the crura and also high pressures here uh, at the LES. But interestingly, rather than having the pressure go up with inspiration, the pressure actually goes down quite dramatically with, with inspiration. And indeed, what you really are finding here is these higher pressures here are really the artifact. Well, how do we know that? Well, we pull the catheter back four centimeters to sort of get, if you will, the kink out of it. And now you see the dramatic difference and the pressure at the esophageal gastric junction, as well as at the level of the crura diaphragm. So you really have to be careful. And I would argue uh, for you beginning manometrists out there, if you're seeing a high pressure zone at the LES and it drops like this with inspiration, you have to be concerned that you have some uh, curl or coiling or impingement of your catheter. And it's probably worth moving the catheter or changing the patient's position to see if this goes away. Now, when looking at, at structural problems, uh, you know, one has to be careful uh, looking at uh, bolus impingement uh, pro or catheter impingement problems versus true uh, outflow obstruction. And I think looking at, at the intrabolus pressure and the bolus flow is really important. Now, Prakash talked about this earlier. People who have a catheters with concurrent impedance can look at bolus flow. And it's important to realize from physics Fluid cannot flow from an area of lower pressure to one of higher pressure. So if 
you're seeing flow across the EG junction and the pressure at the time of that in the esophageal body is 12 and the pressure that you're seeing at the EGJ is 25, you know that pressure of 25 is artifactual. In my experience, most true structural disorders that cause a high intrabolus pressure are mostly by compressive processes, uh, such as uh, compression by a tight bundle placation wrap or compression by a parasophageal hernia, rather than a fixed interluminal narrowing, such as a previously undiagnosed esophageal stricture. And indeed, if your only problem is a 15 millimeter Schottsky ring, and that's the only thing going on, that by itself is unlikely, in my experience, to cause a high intrabolus pressure. Now, that's not to say you can't have interluminal obstruction causing a high intrabolus pressure. There are exceptions here. So here's sort of an example. And here's someone undergoing, who's having symptoms of dysphagia and during the menopause, she's undergoing a rapid drink test. Now we can see here, nice is single swallow where not much is happening. This is a dry swallow. And looks like there's, if you will, LES relaxation here with this. Now, is this the pseudo relaxation that Prakash talked about earlier? Because we certainly see here evidence of esophageal pressurization that extends all the way down, if you will, to the EG junction. Maybe this person has an early form of achalasia. Well, that's actually not what they have. What they have is a really, really, really tight structure here. That's really not much bigger than the diameter of the manometry catheter, which is plugging the hole. So when you put water down here, this is going to pressurize. And I, uh, I'm not going to justify why my colleagues put a catheter across this to look at motility when they have an obvious tight structure. But if you have this sort of thing, then you can get a very high intrabolus pressure from a structural problem. Now, I think the bigger issue and the important thing is to try to figure out among these people who have an exu pattern, who are the ones who truly have a form of fruit of achalasia, the early achalasia where the subject body peristalsis is preserved, but the LAS has lost the normal inhibitory innervation. And uh, Prakash talked earlier about uh, FLIP and, and the rapid drink. Uh, another way to do this is to look at pharmacologic a provocation, and this is something we've been doing really for several decades now at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And one of the things we use is amyl nitrite, which has really been around for years and is relatively cheap. Um, the concept behind this amyl nitrate, which is a nitric oxide donor, causes profound inhibition of uh, smooth muscle tone. And so here we see someone with an exu process here where we have a high IRP, uh, we have a high intrabolus pressure here, and the IRP during this is 21. Now we give amyl nitrate to this person, and one finds a profound inhibition here of the pressure at the esophagogastric junction. Essentially, we have a relaxation value here of two, which gives us, if you will, a relaxation gain of 19 millimeters of mercury. And I'm gonna, Arash Babai and I have looked at this uh, with high resolution manometry, relaxation gains over 10 are consistent with a smooth muscle impairment like you would see in full blown achalasia. The other interesting thing about this process is once the amyl nitrate wears off, we start getting contractility back in. One sees striking after contractions of the LES, usually in excess of 100 millimeters of mercury. You never see this sort of pattern uh, in, in healthy subjects. So, we would argue that this is someone here who has evidence of impairment of the inhibitory innervation of the lower esophageal sphincter. This is someone who has a form proust of achalasia. Now contrast is someone who has more of a structural problem here where we have again an IRP of 22 here. We have some elevation evidence of pressurization right uh, above the esophageal gastric junction. But here we give amyl nitrite and the IRP is still 20. There's only a change of two. This was to tell you that this pressure here is not due to a problem with the smooth muscle LES. Indeed, once it wears off, we see some curl contractions here, but there's no dramatic sustained rebound like we see in the person who has a form proust of achalasia. So that's the way of looking at it on the inhibitory end. We can also 
look at it on the excitatory end and look at cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin has been known for decades as a pharmacologic challenge in which in normal subjects, the LES relaxes, but in people with achalasia, uh, this causes a paradoxical contraction. And you can see this also in patients with EGGU who have an early form of achalasia. Here's one such patient here where we can see again, uh, high intravenous pressure, failure of uh, follow the IRP here. And then following cholecystokinin, rather than having a relaxation of the LES, we see if anything, an increased contraction, this striking shortening, uh, similar to what Prakash had shown earlier, but rather that you can see with the TLESR, but rather than the LES relaxing, we see the tone still going up here, so you can see the LES, followed by really a dramatic uh, contraction here, which has been described as sort of the phase two response to CCK. You never see these in, in normal subjects. So again, we have evidence here pharmacologically of someone who has a true LES denervative problem. So again, when we talk about treating these, I think symptoms are important and I won't uh, go over this much further than what had been said earlier. I think what you should really do is focus on treating those, evaluating those with significant dysphagia, uh, particularly when liquid dysphagia is present, because then we're starting to think we have someone who has uh, a problem with LES dysfunction. Again, treatment, perhaps we should do nothing because as we heard, just observation causes a lot of these to go away. Now, I think the likely reasons for success when you have this is a lot of these people don't have a true pathophysiologic exu. They would have what I call a false positive high IRP, which by itself doesn't mean anything because it's not associated with an elevated intravolus pressure in some of these earlier studies. Another possibility is maybe they do have a high IRP and a high intravolus pressure. This is from contracting the diaphragmatic crura. Robbie Mittal sh showed years ago that if you stress people out, make them contract their diaphragm, you can impede flow briefly across the EG junction. Well, you know, this, the scary aspect of a manometer study might cause this, but that may not be a problem later on. Again, sometimes the symptoms are really from another process. The patient Actually, it's a problem with GERD or maybe a peptic stricture, and, there's, and that's a bigger issue than what you're seeing otherwise. And then finally, sometimes the symptoms of dysphagia are just mild. So again, I think the symptoms are important. I would not treat otherwise. Now with structural disorders, yes, you dilate the strictures, you repair the hernias, particularly the parasophageal hernias. You revise the type, tight fundoplication wraps. You dilate and remove the lap bands that are obstructive. You treat the neoplasia if possible, right? And you treat the other problems present. PPI therapy has had 100% success when it's been employed. So sure, if they're having GERD, treat that, okay? You can use medical therapy. Different ages have been used. As we heard, the response rates are not the greatest. Part of the problem may be is they also affect the esophageal body. They can have systemic side effects. On the other hand, they are also cheap for the most part, and you haven't burned any bridges if they don't work. So often at times where I think they may be the most useful are people who are really not good surgical candidates, or you're trying to temporize before you go to a more definitive therapy. Botulinum toxin was already covered. Uh, again, some benefit. Short-term responses usually require repeating. Concern might be whether these could complicate myotomies down the road due to fibrosis, but there's really no good uh, data on that. These have been reported to have cases of mediastinitis, which potentially could be fatal. I think this is a better option if you have someone who's a high operative risk. Now, when we're talking about medication, we do have to think about, in medication, the opioid business. Similar to what other people have described, we've found a high rate of opiate use among our egg juice, and indeed they make up really uh, over a third of our cases of egg juice. And we're not talking about trivial opiate doses here, uh, for the most part. This is looking at opiates in our, in our manometry laboratory here, and not a big issue among the people who have these types of motor patterns, normal and effective motility in achalasia, but in type three achalasia, and especially in egg juice, 
in our EGU people, the median opioid dose was in excess of 200 uh, milligrams of morphine equivalent daily. These are really high doses. And as has been shown before, if you get them off the opioids, you can revert this. This was the MMED of 250 milligrams a day and then tapered down to 30. That whole abnormal pattern has now resolved. The problem, of course, is making sure how do you tell that they're on opiates. You can look at online databases, but they don't help you uh, if the patient's using illicit opiates. And again, the issue is trying to get patients to come down on these uh, when they've been on them for so long. But showing them the benefits that they can have it makes it a little more uh, compelling to get them to try this. Again, with impaired LH relaxation, people have used bougie and TTS and well as pneumatic dilation. Uh, we heard about this earlier. This is an example of the response to pneumatic dilation in someone who has a high IRP, a very high intrabolus pressure here, and following pneumatic dilation, uh, this, is, this aspect of it has essentially been abolished. Again, we heard about various forms of myotomy. This can either be due through a poem or a laparoscopic myotomy. Success has been seen in both these approaches in small numbers to date. My concern about these has to do with the long-term risk of GERD, particularly in the POIM procedures, which currently don't have a, a valid anti-reflux procedure as part of them. My other concern is you tend to sacrifice some portion of normal motility in someone who has just exu and normal esophageal body peristalsis. You know, to make sure you get rid of the LES, you also wind up sacrificing maybe a partly a normal esophageal body. The other concern, if you're not careful, is creating another exu problem by doing an abnormal or inappropriate anti-reflux procedure. And we've, I've certainly seen people who've come in after having had a myotomy and had a full nissen and basically have obstructive symptoms again. So to summarize, to me, the real issue here is identifying if the high IRP really represents pathophysiologic exu. And then if that's the case, whether this is LES dysfunction, a form of acalasia versus a structural process. And if it's an LES dysfunction, if opiates are the cause. The true LES dysfunction, I think, can be palliated by uh, several different uh, methods, though obviously not cured. The thing, again, I think we have to remember is this is a nuisance problem. It's not a threat to life. So you have to be careful about creating another problem. And my particular concern is people who undergo uh, Heller myotomies and, and poems uh, for a high IRP that doesn't really represent an honest to God exu. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Crystal, Prakash, and Benson for a wonderful review and state-of-the-art lectures on um, EGJ outflow uh, obstruction. And I, we will bring the rest of our panel uh, up for questions. And while everybody is uh, getting back online, I've got a couple questions that uh, came from the, the group here. Um, I'll start this one for Crystal. Regarding the, the opiates, the question was how long would you hold the opiates um, if possible? And if they can't or are unwilling to hold it, what do you do? I think that's a great question. Um, one of the opiate studies had actually only held them for 24 hours and did see some difference, but I think the time course still needs to be um, better defined. In reality, when we have patients with significant symptoms and weight loss, and they aren't able to get off the opiates, we do, you know, case by case, sometimes treat them. If this is going to be a long-term thing they're on, and it's, it's basically not an option and causing issues, um, we, will, we will consider um, treating them. And usually we bring those cases to our multidisciplinary swallow conference to discuss first in a, in a sort of group setting. Can I make a comment about that? In, in some cases, you, ca you, you can make a case for doing the study on the opiate to confirm that they have a spastic process and then take them off. 
and consider uh, if uh, their symptoms improve or repeat a study at a, at, at a future time. You saw those very nice uh, uh, HRM images from Benson um, showing a change in what the motor pattern looks like. In some instances, you need to prove to the patient that it's, it's the opiate that's the problem rather than do something dramatic to their esophagus. So, so Benson, um, to follow up on precautious thought, do you do an on versus off esophageal manometry to confirm that opiates indeed is the cause? Well, that's one of the things we would like to be able to do. I mean, the, the difficulty, of course, is confirming that they really are truly off of them. Uh, Arash Prabhai and I had looked at this, at least with the type 3 achalasia, and it's interestingly, pharmacologically, uh, you can see some differences in response uh, with the type 3. So, for instance, Remember when I showed the CCK where you had the dramatic shortening up but the LAS did not contract and you had that huge sort of dramatic contraction of the LAS and body in the phase two. You don't see that for the most part in people who are on opiates. So if you see that sort of thing going on, you probably have someone who's really got an underlying true inhibitory permanent disorder as opposed to simply a pharmacologic blockade of the inhibitory pathways by opiates. And a follow-up question to that from uh, the group is, do mu uh, receptor antagonists help me in this situation if the EGJ outflow obstruction is due to opiates? And that's open to anybody on the panel. So uh, from, from my anecdotal, an anecdotal use, I'd, I would say no. I would agree. At, at the, at the uh, Charlotte uh, meeting that Baja organized, I ran into somebody uh, who worked in the pain service who told me that oral naloxone uh, sometimes helps dysphagia in the setting of opiate use. And I told that lady to, go, to do a study and, and write it up if that's indeed true. But I have, not, I have no direct, uh, uh, no direct uh, knowledge about that. Okay, so this is a poll for our panel and I'll start with Prakash on this. So if, what would you tell your surgeons if you saw a parasophageal hernia and EGJ outflow obstruction on the manometry, what do they fix? In what order and do you fix all of it at once? So, so this, this, this was a question I think that came up twice on that chat and I, I, I actually responded to that. You, you can have outflow obstruction from the parasophageal hernia by yeah. definition there is a little bit of stomach that is stuck between the esophagus and the diaphragmatic hiatus, and it can obstruct. And so um, you, you don't do a myotomy in that setting. You, you do complementary testing. You can do a barium pill swallow. You can do an endoscopy, make sure there's nothing else going on. Sometimes I've done flip in this setting. But uh, no, I don't think in these settings you, you, you just repair the parasophageal hernia and, and you, you have the surgeon create a partial or a full wrap, depending on what the esophageal body peristaltic performance is on the manometry. Benson? Well, see, here's, this is exactly the case where you're worried about a mixed process, where, you know, they've clearly got a structural problem with the parasophageal hernia, but how do you know they don't have a form fruits of achalasia as well? And this is where I think the pharmacologic approach could be really handy, because what you might find, and we've seen cases like this with for instance, someone who's done a tight wrap, and now the question is, it looks sort of outflow obstruction -y. Is it the wrap, or do they have early achalasia, or both? What you'll see with something like with amyl nitrite is the IRP, if you will, goes from 40 down to 20, which is the significant relaxation compared to what they did with a swallow, but you still have residual pressure of 20, which is probably the wrap. So when you have that in that setting, you have someone who's probably got an early form of achalasia, and a tight wrap and a pair of esophageal hernia. There, I'd be more inclined to have them say, uh, you fix the parasophageal hernia, but there you may need to do a myotomy as well. On the other hand, if after amyl nitrite and someone's got a parasophageal hernia, the IRP really doesn't change, I'd say just take down the, the, the parasophageal hernia. So one quick question for you, Crystal. Would you do a flip in the OR or have the surgeon do a flip in the OR? Quick yes or no before we end. I, uh, I think in this case, the surgeon would probably want me in the OR to do it with him and, or her, and I'm happy to. Per perfect. And with that, um, we end the, the session on, on EGJ outflow obstruction. 
Uh, once again, thank you to Crystal Prakash and Benson for kicking off our virtual symposia. And uh, please save the dates for our upcoming sessions for the rest of uh, 2020. Uh, we would love to hear feedback as we uh, roll this out. Um, and thank you once again for joining us um, and have the re great rest of your day, evening, if you're on the East Coast. Take care.